welcome to Vintage Con. It's good to be here with you. I appreciate Lyle this morning. Lyle, thank you for uh, the way you introduced yourself this morning. Um, I know you said you were the fun girl at the bar, the pretty ones. I was the girl that didn't know that there was a party. So, yeah. You thought being Leah was bad. I'm Leah and Rachel's sister you didn't even know existed. So, uh, thrilled to be here and to be part of what God's doing here at Vintage Con for our partner churches. Welcome. Uh, we love you. Glad you're here. My task before uh, you today is to uh, share a little bit on growing in our leadership towards the mission. Growing in our leadership towards the mission. Remember back to where you were September 11, 2001. And I'm, I'm realizing that at this point in my life, there's some people in here who probably weren't even born yet. <laughs> September 11, 2001. I remember exactly where I was. It's the only time in my life that I've slept on my friend's couch because I didn't have a place to live. It was my brother's 18th birthday. And it was the day I was supposed to start my new job. But it's a day that changed everything here in America. And those planes hit the towers. Something happened to us in America. The intensity and the, the, the ambition and the uh, inspiration to pursue justice, the rallying together, the dependence upon God. I think of our president at the time, George Bush, standing in the rubble and telling the, the, the first responders that I can hear you. The world hears you. The people that knock these down, these buildings down, they will hear us all. What started that day was an intensity towards a mission to find justice. Operation Enduring Freedom started just a few weeks later and lasted for years. The war in Afghanistan, the Iraqi war, continued for years. And years. And the reality is what happened is that the intensity and the fervor and the ambition for freedom and success in the Middle East faded within our country. In fact, many of us don't know the date that the war ended. We probably could go back to 2011 when we heard reports that Osama bin Laden uh, was uh, killed. And maybe was the last time we celebrated this mission that we were once passionate about. It's not the first time in our, church, or in our country's history that we've had that experience with war and the fatigue that came with the mission. But it's not just wars in our country that that happens. It's in many initiatives and tasks and, and processes and things that we're about that we start with ambition and passion. We're compelled and then fatigue sets in. Unfortunately, the reality is that's true for us in the mission of the church, in the mission of Christ. Lyle mentioned it today. Greg mentioned it in a workshop yesterday. Barna report says 42% of full-time vocational ministry. That's 42%. So in this room, that's, I got good math. That's almost half of us. It's this section right here who seriously considered over the last year or last two years to just give up, be done with it. Significant more people who didn't get to that point of quitting, they just said, man, I'm exhausted, I'm stressed. The expectations aren't what I thought they would be. The growth isn't where I thought it would be. I'm discouraged, I'm exhausted, I'm fatigued. If that's true for those who are giving their life and Vocation, that's so true for the rest of us who are serving without a paycheck. I'm concerned. The reality of this lifelong mission we are on, that there is this reality of mission fatigue. And we as leaders and as servants and as team leaders and as team members, we cannot lead toward the mission when we are paralyzed by, when we are exhausted in the mission ourselves. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons that lead us to fatigue and exhaustion. 
spiritual and physical, internal and external, political and social. We heard even last night of some real ones on the spiritual that can lead us to fatigue in the mission because of not being with Jesus. And my task today is not to try to outline all the reasons or the solutions for them, but what I want to remind us of, what I want to place before us, what I want to offer is this reality that, that I am, that I'm, that's impressed upon me is that mission fatigue threatens our ability to lead ourselves and to lead others to the mission. Mission exhaustion. It threatens us to, to have the ability to lead others to the mission that we are called to. Which leads to this question, what or how do we protect from that fatigue? How do we combat that fatigue? And that in and of itself is a multifaceted answer that we've already been presented in the first three sessions that are part of the answer. What we just heard from Lyle, remembering as Ron taught us of, of our, our, our love for the lost and our call to reach the lost and in our growing and sitting at the feet of Jesus. So, so this afternoon, here's for just a few minutes, I want to add to that conversation. I wanna continue that conversation as we seek to grow together and offer convictions that are grounded in God's word that we can hold on to. Convictions of the mission that we can give away as we go back to our homes and our teams that will impact and influence not just us, but others with the Spirit's help to combat mission fatigue, real fatigue really happening right now in this room and in our churches as we pursue the Great Commission with redeemed ambition. I hope it's helpful for you. There's convictions to combat mission fatigue. That's how we'll do it. And I'm gonna offer three of them. Three convictions to combat mission fatigue. First, it's this. The mission is critical. It's not overstated. We must be convinced that the mission is critical. You could put the word crucial. You could put the word central. It is, cannot be overstated. We tend to exaggeration, don't we? That's the best meal I've ever had. That's the best experience I've ever been to. Man, that's the best sermon I ever preached. That's the best small group I've ever led. That's the worst meal I've ever had. It's the worst thing that I've ever gone through in life. And in the reality, that may have just been true, all of those. Until you go to that new restaurant. You thought Applebee's was killing it. And then you drove by this place called Chili's. <laughs> that experience you've had may be the worst one until the next one. But when you go to God's word and when you sit at the feet of Jesus and when you look at what, is, what, did, God, what did God create, what is his plan, what his design, I'm just telling you convictionally from God's word, we will never find anything as important as his mission. God being glorified, it's why we exist. It's why he created, created us. It's why he redeemed us. It's why he sent his son to die for us. It's why he designed his church to, to have, have, have people proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus. It's why we apply the gospel to the followers of Jesus because it, the mission of Christ is critical. It's the most important thing. And everything else we find in here as we go through it and we're like, man, God calls me to be this as a husband or God calls me to be this as a wife does not play, take place of the mission of Christ. It falls under the mission of Christ. So we can battle, we can combat mission fatigue when we, when we convictionally hold to that this mission, clarity in the mission precision in the mission that God being glorified can not be overstated. The mission is critical. It cannot be overstated. Our understanding of the mission and our ambition for the mission today, tomorrow, this coming year, regardless of the trials or the, or the victories, and for years to come flows out of our understanding of our creator his design, his plan, his purpose, and his command. When we grasp this convictionally, it will consume us. 
I love, I love what we get in scripture about the apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, the, the mission of Christ consumed him. It became his passion. How many of you are prone to being consumed by things? Like consumed, you're just that way. You pick up a book and you don't put it down until it's done. I just, I, 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 I wanna stay away from that so I just don't pick up books. <laughs> you're consumed. We're consumed by things. Apostle Paul was consumed by this mission. It wasn't just the Apostle Paul, but the first believers in Acts chapter two, they were consumed, weren't they? They started gathering every day. They started giving radically. They were consumed by it. They, the apostles, they spent their lives for this gospel. They gave their lives for the gospel and fatigue can begin to creep in for us. And we are at risk of mission fatigue when we replace the real mission, God's glory through the redemption of his people, with lesser ambitions or flat out wrong ambitions. We're at risk when our programs become central. Our career becomes the most important. Our feelings take top priority. Our resume needs to be built. When the affirmation that we want to receive is priority or the encouragement or the opportunity or accolades, these threaten or lead us to the potential and the risk of mission fatigue because we have the wrong thing as the central thing. If we're gonna continue to lead ourselves towards the mission, if we're gonna lead our churches and our groups and our teams towards the mission, we must hold as a conviction, stay grounded in the conviction that the mission is critical. It's the most important and it cannot be overstated. That's number one. I would ask if it's good, but I learned from Ron. They're not gonna say they are. So I hope it was good. That's one, that's the first conviction. Second, I must be convinced that the work is compelling, not overwhelming. That the work of the mission is actually compelling. It's not overwhelming. The work and the reality of the mission ought to compel us to the work, should not exhaust us thinking about the overwhelming nature of the work. I wanna just give five reasons, so we may take a little more time here, but five reasons why I think, I think God's word shows us, and you can add to it, maybe you can take away from them, but here's a five of them of why the mission of the work is compelling. First, we are invited into it. Isn't it something different when you get invited different than when you kind of put yourself forward for it. You hear that there's a people going to lunch and you're like, maybe I should go. It's different when you're invited. You're invited. You were asked to be a part of it. You were chose to be a part of it. And here this afternoon, maybe this is what you need. God has invited you into his mission. He chose you. He chose you. He chose me and God has always been about inviting men and women into his mission. It goes back to creation before, well before the fall to Adam and Eve. He invited them into mission. He said, take dominion over this creation and, and you're the ones that are gonna be the ones who multiply people for this earth. He's invited into the mission. Throughout all of redemptive history, all of redemptive history, Old covenant, new covenant. God has been inviting men and women into his mission. We heard about Moses this morning, invited to lead his people out of Egypt. Joshua, invited to lead people into the promised land. The kings, invited to reign. The judges, to, to lead to repentance. The priests, to lead in worship. All throughout history. The prophets, invited to speak the word of God. And then that day, some sometime around 3 BC, just a young ordinary couple, a young ordinary lady, Mary, who God invited to carry, to be part of his mission, to bring salvation to his people. He invited 12 ordinary men, Mark chapter three, where he selected the 12 to follow him, to be with him, to send them out to preach the gospel. He's invited us into it. 
He invited ordinary women to be the first to see that the grave was empty and to proclaim the good news of the victory of the resurrection to the world. He's chosen ordinary people. This is compelling that we we have been invited into this. When he said, you shall be my witnesses. When he said, as you are going, go and preach the gospel. It is our invitation into his mission. It changes our perspective of the work in the mission. We're invited into it. That's one. Two, we are gifted for it. We are gifted for it beyond how God has created us, beyond how he has wired us, beyond how the the talents he has given us and the skills by his spirit, he has given to us gifts specifically to be used for his mission. He's gifted us for it. Meant to be used in the context of his church, our local churches. Romans Chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 remind us that we're one body with many members having gifts that differ. And as I was preparing for this, I was just, I was struck again by Paul in Romans after he tells us that we have gifts that differ. He says, let us use them. It's compelling because we actually have something to offer because he has given it to us for his mission. So whether it's prophecy or service or teaching, exhortation, generosity, leadership, acts of mercy, helping administration, he has entrusted us. The God overall, who knows all, who has all, has entrusted to us, he has gifted to us things to be stewarded in this mission for as long as we're here. Matthew chapter uh, 25, 26, I forget. I did a workshop on it yesterday, the parable of the stewards. The master went away for a long period. Mission fatigue is possible because this mission is a long mission until Jesus returns or we enter the grave. He has given gifts for it and he's given them to us. Third, we're invited, we're gifted, we are partnered in it. Friends, loved ones, we are not alone. This is not a solo mission. This is a mission where we get to lock arms with one another. We get to be with servants in our local church and in partnerships around the country and around the world. God establishes teams to lead and to serve, establishes offices, and gives gifts, many members, fellow laborers, Paul was all about partnership. He was all about partnership. Read his prayers. Go to Philippians chapter one and you see uh, he thanks God in every remembrance of them for their partnership in the gospel. It's compelling. It's overwhelming if we think it's on us. If we're all alone in this, Paul in Romans 16, I love this because when we think of Paul and we think of partnership with Paul, we think of Timothy. We think of John Mark. We think of, a Barnabas, but in, in Romans 16, we get some insight into like, man, God could even use me. People's names, we, we don't know. Some I can't even pronounce. So you can read it. Romans 16, where Phoebe and Priscilla and Aquila and Mary, Junia, and then a whole lot more. We are not alone, and that's compelling. That helps us as we combat, combat mission fatigue as we hold to the conviction that this is a compelling mission that we are on. Not only are we partnered with people for it, but fourth, we are empowered for it. Yes, we are his witnesses, but when? When are we his witnesses? When the Holy Spirit will come upon us and when the power will be given to us, we have the very presence of God empowering us. We are empowered for it, Colossians 1. Paul knew of this strength from the power of the spirit. We are empowered for it. And fifth, we are prepared for it. We are prepared for it. Now, what I don't want us to think here, because likely you're sitting there saying, oh, actually, I'm not prepared for it. Yeah, is there training to be done? Is there growth to be had? Is there learning to be had? Yes. But think of the prepared. We got some runners out here. Yeah, good. The rest of you are like me. Good. So... Nick just ran a marathon. Nick, 
not in here. Duly noted. You're here. Oh, uh. You're ready for that marathon. And you're standing on, that was probably starting line. You're going for the finish line. That's all, I know that. I'm not talking about the preparation that happened in the past. I'm talking about the preparation that you know what's ahead. You know it's 26.2 miles. You know the difficulties that are gonna come. You know the cramps that you're gonna have. You even know where the stations are, where the support is gonna come. You're prepared. There's enough in God's word that when we commit to know and believe God's word, to know what's ahead of us on this mission. Doesn't mean it's easy and it's not. Otherwise we wouldn't be talking about fatigue. For spiritual warfare, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's physical difficulties. The apostle Paul, he went through much, didn't he? I just jotted down a few things. Imprisonment and persecutions awaited him. He was kidnapped, he was beaten, he was threatened, arrested many times. There's are just a few of them. He was accused, interrogated, ridiculed, ignored. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a snake. That's possible here in Arizona. Or a scorpion. But he toiled. He knew it was gonna be a toil. He knew it was a labor strengthened by his God, but it was a labor. So we, we, church, the big C, we're compelled because we're prepared. We know what's ahead of us. God has been kind to give it to us, but it's not just the difficulties. We know that we labor with a promise. We strive with a confidence in the promise of Christ who said, I will build my church. We labor with an example. We, we run the race looking to Jesus who endured the cross. And we labor with victory guaranteed. There is no question about the outcome of this mission. There is no question of where Jesus is sitting. And there is no question of whether he will return. We're prepared for it. So these reasons and many more, we, are, we have a conviction that the mission we are on, that we have been invited into, is a compelling mission, it's not overwhelming. So when we feel overwhelmed, we look to our power, the spirit for comfort. When we are overwhelmed and sensing the fatigue coming, we, we lock arms with our brothers and sisters. When we are, are feeling the fatigue coming on, we go to God's word and reminded that he chose us, he loved us, he is with us, and he has promised victory. The mission is compelling not overwhelming. So when that fatigue sets in, or it will set in when we simply think that we opted into this for a period of time and we get to choose when we opt out. Or we think incorrectly about what God has given to us. We think we're owners instead of stewards. We think the talents are for our glory, not his. We think he hasn't given us enough. We are find ourselves, we're fatigued when we find ourselves more frustrated with our ministry partners than we are grateful for them. And we are more interested in our exposure and our opportunities than the collective accomplishments of the team for the mission of Christ. Fatigue sets in when we rely upon ourselves, where there's no sense of dependence, no sense of weakness, no need for the spirit's strength and comfort and grace or power. And fatigue sets in when we hold on to what we think the journey should be like. When we set the expectation, when we value comfort over commitment. So if I could be so bold, I think this is where we are at risk. I think we believe that the mission is critical. 
but I think a culture, the world that we live in, we have a high value and freedom to do what we want and what we feel. We have a high value on a strong grip of what we have and using it for our good. We have a high value of individual accomplishment, looking out for ourselves and climbing the ladder and, and, and having an identity that's caught up in the recognition of others. We have a low sense of need for help and a low tolerance for difficulty. And it leads to mission fatigue that paralyzes us and what God has called us to in does not allow us to have the ability to lead those who God has called us to influence. Mission fatigue threatens our ability to lead ourselves and others to the mission. That's the second. Now third, and then we'll be done. Third, I'm convinced. Third conviction to combat mission fatigue is this. The progress is celebrated. It's not overlooked. Progress is celebrated. It's not overlooked. We, we live in a culture and, uh, and have a culture of celebration. We, we love to celebrate things. And my wife, Amber, and I uh, just celebrated our 20, 20th, that's right, 20th anniversary. Well, technically, yeah, yeah, yeah. She deserves all of that. We haven't really celebrated it yet, though, because the anniversary was on the night of our sixth graders' recorder concert. I don't think that's celebratory. <laughs> we celebrate anniversaries. We celebrate birthdays. Both of those, catch this, both of those are progress. It's not accomplishment. It's progress. We celebrate progress. I love coaching basketball. I love coaching my boys in basketball. And what I learned as I coached them when they were young is I had to find uh, things to celebrate with them for. Because generally for the team, it had nothing to do with how they played. <laughs> right? You be, I, I had to, and you do in the context you are, you had, to, you had to come up with values and you had to come up with, with character and things that are worthy of celebration, practice and effort and, and, and teamwork. And it changes the way that, that you coach them. It changes the way that you talk to them because you are looking for things to celebrate in them. So while our culture celebrates progress, oftentimes I think, and I'm in this, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I'm not preaching. I'm talking to myself. That the church, in the church, progress on the mission of Christ gets overlooked. It's failed to be seen, said, or celebrated. Sunday's coming. You got a message to prepare in a few days. Easter's coming in 49, no, I have no many days, but it's coming. The next thing is always coming. The next phone call's coming. The next counseling meeting's coming. The next conversation with your staff, the next huddle's coming. <laughs> Oftentimes, celebration gets overlooked. The ground we are taking, the fruit we are bearing, the growth we are seeing, the transformation we are experiencing in the mission cannot be overlooked. Otherwise, mission fatigue is, is at our doorstep. I need this for my soul. I need celebration in the progress of the mission for my soul. And I'm confident you need it for your soul. Because execution of the work of the mission will never truly satisfy. But celebration in the progress of the mission will foster a true satisfaction, joy, and will fuel future execution. We must celebrate. We, we see this again in scripture throughout our New Testament, which is, which is both a model to us and an encouragement for us. Acts 2 after Peter preaches, three tells us in 241, and tells us 3,000 people saved and baptized, worthy of celebration. Just six verses later, day by day, adding to the number being saved. Acts 4, 4, those heard, believed, and the number came to about 5,000. Now, I get it. You might be saying, if I saw those results, I'd be celebrating too. But we experience progress in the mission all the time. 
and we heard it last night in the open mics. That is celebrating the progress in the mission. God's faithfulness, real faithfulness, making real changes and real transformation in our lives. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, he wasn't, he wasn't in 1 Corinthians 1, he wasn't celebrating thousands coming to Christ. He was celebrating in, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, he was celebrating the evidences of grace in the life of that church. And if you've read 1 Corinthians at all, you know he's got a lot more to say. And it's not celebrating evidences of grace, but before he ever got to the correction and the exhortation that is needed in that church, he, he knew that celebration for what God had done is important for the mission of Christ. And we should follow his model, his leadership. I'm sure your heart was encouraged and fueled for mission as you heard Ron yesterday celebrate the work of God in his life to go and tell others about Christ. And the celebration to hear of God using him to lead his sister to Christ. Like, like, was I the only one of celebration welling up inside? We need that. And God is allowing you and I to be part of his mission. We get to be part of it. The question is, is our head down or are we seeing it? And then after seeing it, are we, are we saying it and are we celebrating it? Your Team Huddle needs celebration before we open our doors on Sunday. Our staffs, our staff meetings need to be filled with celebration. Our leader meetings, our small groups, before we, we get to the time to talk about everything and it's tough and the prayer because we need celebration of what God is doing in our one-on-one -on -one conversations. We need celebration. We, I think by God's spirit, can combat fatigue when we celebrate the mission of Christ and the progress that we see in it. This hit home to me about 10 years ago. My wife and I flew down here to consider being part of what God was doing here at Christ Church. Church plant was seven, eight months old. My wife and I sat in Adam and Renee's living room probably spent an hour and a half watching God at work stories from another church's library on YouTube, celebrating what God was at work doing and talking about what God could continue to do in our local church, committed to the same type of church, committed to the same pillars, to the same mission, depending upon the same spirit. It fueled my passion and ambition for the mission. We may not have the production quality to produce all those. We don't need video. It's great that we've got the stuff in Nicaragua. We don't, need, we don't need video and technology. We don't have to have it to celebrate what God is doing, but we have to prioritize it. We have to make time for it. And then it's awesome when we have technology to be able to see it in a fresh and new way. We celebrate. Mission fatigue threatens our ability to lead ourselves and others to the mission. Daniel Pink is an author. I don't know if any of you read Daniel Pink. Uh, I was introduced to him 14 years ago when I was helping run a business in Texas. And Daniel Pink this month on Twitter, it's not a, it's not a plug for Twitter. I'm just telling you where I got it. Daniel Pink, uh, Daniel Pink this month on Twitter is asking a question a day to help his followers think. And I think it was February 5th, he asked this question. What do I believe today that I didn't believe 10 years ago? Here's my answer. That mission fatigue is real. And you may be sitting there and saying, Jeff, you're late to the party. But it's real. Mission fatigue will threaten our ability to lead those who God has called us to, but to lead ourselves to what God has invited us into, what he has prepared us for, what he has empowered and gifted us for, what he has partnered us with for. So if I can offer anything today as we try to grow together, it's this, that God has called us to his mission. What a great opportunity.
And his word offers convictions that can ground us in truth. And his spirit offers his grace that is sufficient. When we feel the beginnings of fatigue and exhaustion and when we're paralyzed in that exhaustion. So today, if you find yourself barely able to make the next step, run to Christ. Depend upon him. His mission is worth it. It's the most important thing. And it's what he created you and I for. Mission fatigue threatens our ability to lead ourselves and others to the mission. Would you pray with me? God, I'm thankful for your word and I'm thankful for the experiences you allow us to have. I thank you that this journey we are on, we are on as part of your mission, that the spirit has empowered us to be a part of it. I thank you for your grace that is abundant in it. It's sufficient for us. God, I pray that this afternoon that this room would be filled of people who are have a fresh sense and idea of the importance of your mission, not of tasks that need to be done, but your heart to reach the lost and to transform lives and the privilege we have to be a part of it. Spirit, I pray that you'd encourage here this afternoon as we grow together. God, may our, may, as we go home, may our churches and our teams, whether on staff or the ones we're rallying to be part of the mission in the local context, God, would you ground us in the convictions from your word that your mission is worth it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. If we don't know each other, my name's Nick, and I serve here at Christ Church. The sort of perfunctory thing that you're supposed to do in this moment is say thank you to the guy who just spoke, but I want to stop for just a minute, and uh, I, want to go, I want to go beyond kind of the obligatory gratitude to Jeff Carlson to let you know something that I'm sure many of you already understand, but some of you may not, that if you have ever been touched or impacted by the ministry of Christ Church or Vintage Mission. And as I look around this room, I know, I know many of you, and I know that your lives have been impacted by what God has been doing here. I know that your marriages are stronger. I know that your mission is clearer. I know that your mind and heart have been renewed by the ministry of God's word here. I know that your hands and your spiritual gifts have found expression in new ways here. I know many of you are from cities around the country and around the globe, and your churches have had an injection of energy and clarity and mission because of the encouragement of Vintage Mission. And if you at all find yourself in the category of having been impacted by Christ Church or Vintage Mission, I just need you to know that you have Jeff Carlson to thank for that. And so can we thank him? One of the things I'm so encouraged by is that the way he just finished his talk is true. I've been rolling with Jeff for about a decade, and I have watched him under the burden of responsibility to steward and lead all that God is doing here, I have seen fatigue take its toll on Jeff, and I have seen him practice what he just preached to you and set his heart and his affections on the mission of Jesus Christ and endure through the fatigue. And my, this commendation is not just like an out there big organizational thing. I would not be half the leader I am if it wasn't for your influence in my life. And so I just honor you and thank you.